So now to the topics of the hour. Uh, without further ado, please give a warm remote welcome to our first speaker, Dana Burtness, who will be speaking about pasture raised pigs using the wagon wheel model. Dana. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go and share. All right, hopefully that's working for you. So hi everybody, my name is Dana Burtness. My husband Nick and I run Nettle Valley Farm, which is so in southeastern Minnesota, just about a half an hour north of Decorah. Let's see, there we go. So this season will be our sixth season finishing hogs on pasture on our land. We started with 10 pigs back in 2016 and have grown pretty steadily over the years. Oop, yeah, here we go. Uh, this year we'll be finishing 75 to 80 Hampshire hogs on about eight acres of the 80 acres we manage. Some basics about us just for context. We're a seasonal finishing only farm. So we don't farrow, not yet anyways. Uh, we get 80 pound feeder pigs in June and then take them to over 300 pounds ideally by fall. We sell them to, uh, by, we sell them by the whole and half to families in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. So here's our land base. It's very, it's a very weird uh, outline, but that's a, that's another talk. Um, we also run an incubator farm program, um, and uh, shameless plug: we are looking for two new incubates for the 2022 season. So uh, more information about that on our website. So our niche is marketing to customers who are obsessed with flavor and the highest animal welfare possible. In order to capture that super high quality flavor profile, we line up the crucial flavor development phase of the pork, which is the last two to three months of the pig's life. And so that's lined up with when fall goodies like apples and pumpkins and other veggie treats are at their peak. We trade our friends at Featherstone Farm, a hog, for thousands of pounds of organic pig grade produce throughout the season. So that's pretty much what we do in a nutshell. Um, but the focus of my lightning talk is why we switch from a purely pasture-based system, finishing system, to what we are calling the wagon wheel hub model. So uh, here's how we used to finish, pasture finish our pigs. Using electric fencing and mobile feed and water and shade infrastructure, we would set up a paddock where the pigs and their stuff would stay for up to a week, depending on a bunch of factors, like the size of the paddock, soil moisture, etc. When it came time to move, we would set up a second paddock next door and move the pigs and all their stuff right next door. With 10 to 25 hogs, this worked pretty well, um, but as we grew in numbers, we ran into some serious issues. For those of you know, who know hogs, this will come as no surprise, but pigs hate being hot, so they need a ton of shade and a way to cool off when it's over about 65 to 67 degrees in our experience. And on the flip side of that, when it's raining or snowing, for maximum pig happiness, they really need a place where they can be dry and out of the wind. So we were running into some big challenges with, uh, with mobile shelters that would protect all the pigs comfortably and be easy to move. Oh, I hate showing this picture, but it's the truth. <laughs> Another issue was occasional soil degradation. When conditions are right, pigs can be an awesome part of building soil health on a farm by grazing and trampling forage, and of course, pooping and peeing and upping fertility. Um, and do we, they do do some light disturbance that can lead to pasture biodiversity. However, when it rains for five days in a row and you can't take them off of pasture, it can be like having 75 little rototillers out there mucking around in saturated soil, turning it into concrete and really compacting and just damaging the crap out of your soil. So in our quest to be a truly regenerative pastured hog farm that also really focuses on pigs thriving, not just surviving, we started to look for a different model. Um, enter the wagon wheel hub model. We are inspired by the, the model the Rodale Institute uses at their demonstration farm. Here's the basic idea. Instead of schlepping all their stuff from one paddock to the next, you have a central hub where all their stuff stays, and then you use fencing to make the spokes or the paddocks or the paddocks plus laneways to graze the fields around the hub when conditions are right. The way our farm is laid out, it's actually more like a hot air balloon rather than a wagon wheel. So after making some modifications to a hay shed in spring 2020, we tried it last year and absolutely loved it. I cannot tell you how many times I sat there in inclement weather and was thanking my lucky stars that we made this switch. So there's definitely some pros and some cons. Um, when it's hot, there was definitely abundant mud and shade. Uh, when it was wet, there was more than enough space for each pig to lie down and be completely dry. 
When it was windy, there were plenty of spots to nestle into organic straw and be out of the cold. Plus on really cold days at the end of the season, they were roasty toasty because of the deep bedded pack was like 90 to 100 degrees as it was composting just a couple inches below the surface. And then when we saw rain in the forecast, we were able to confine the pigs to their wagon wheel hub in this quote unquote lobby until the soil was dry again. This discouraged rooting and eliminated the big pits or the wallows that um, pigs make out in the pasture. We also had just way more flexible grazing. I didn't have to move through the fields sequentially. Um, handling, uh, this is our old way of handling and, um, and, and weighing. Uh, it's been so much easier to manage with the wagon wheel hub. Since we built a chute and a scale on the west side of the hub, we were able to weigh them every two weeks, which both helped us track, uh, track average daily gains and get them used to walking through the chute that was connected to our livestock trailer. So um, loading them up for their one bad day was, was um, for the most part, easier than chasing them around on pasture. Uh, we were also able to build a hospital pen just right adjacent to the wagon wheel hub. So we we're easy, more easily able to isolate, treat, and monitor pigs. This pig had pneumonia, so we were able to isolate him and feed him scrambled eggs and just monitor him real easily. Um, and just as far as the labor savings go, we were so pleased with how much less labor and time on the tractor we were able to spend. Um, no dragging feet around, no dragging uh, wagon or um, water wagons around. So definitely some challenges. Um, we don't have a we didn't have a huge issue with parasites, but my hunch is that the parasite load in the lobby could become a problem. So this spring, we're going to add concrete to the wagon wheel hub and the lobby in order to prevent this. But we're also going to be doing a PFI cooperators trial where we compare the effects of no intervention, ivermectin, and then in the natural um, dewormer. Um, we also had a, a drastically increased bedding cost, um, but that's offset by the really amazing rich compost that we get. Um, flies were also a big problem, so we're going to be or, uh, really focusing on that this year. And back to this wallow, you know, the pigs made a gigantic wallow in their lobby area, which quickly became disgusting, which of course they loved, um, but I'm very convinced that this is not good for herd health. So next year during the hot months, I'm going to set up some sort of sprinkler and fan system in the shade of a different connected barn with a concrete floor. So some next steps, we were super stoked uh, to get a uh, $5,000 grant from American Farmland Trust in Tillamook Dairy. So we're gonna use all that $5,000 to uh, make wagon wheel hub improvements. So that's my presentation. Please keep in touch. Um, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, where we post a lot of really uh, fun pig videos and, um, and pictures on there. And please get in touch if you have any um, advice for us or um, questions, I love talking shop. So. Thanks to PFI for letting me do this lightning talk. Oops, you're on mute. Uh, thank you so much, Dana. We are going to our next speaker. It's Jim Fitkin. I will be having the slides here and Jim will be presenting on what is popcorn? Jim. Jim, can you unmute? Oh. I'm unmuted now. OK, great. OK, we can start with the popcorn. I start now, right? at the beginning. I'm sorry, can you, everyone see my screen? We see you. Okay. Okay, we have we have popcorn popping, and I guess since this is a virtual meeting, you're going to have to think it think of it as virtual, and imagine what that popcorn is going to smell like. So, but at any rate, um, I'm Jim Fitkin. I've been uh, I farm up by Cedar Falls. I've been uh, I guess I've been growing popcorn all my life. I think since about twelve, I started growing popcorn in the garden. And uh, on and off. And then uh, I guess it'd be 1986 was when I kind of started to grow it professionally, I guess. That's when I started to sell it. I started selling popcorn at the hy V store in Cedar Falls. And uh, I've expanded since then. I, think I must be in like 20 or 25 hy V stores now. And, I, and over, over the years, the last 35 years, I've sold 
Oh, a number, number of different places. And uh, this last year was down quite a bit because of COVID. A lot of places couldn't give away. Right. I've been doing it for a while. And then we can go to the first slide here. And we should be seeing, yeah, here we see, this is popcorn. It, it looks just like field corn. If you're driving along the road, it looks just like field corn. It's uh, typically, it would be a little like a foot or two shorter, but then just like field corn, there's a lot of uh, different varieties or hybrids of field corn. It's the same with popcorn. There are a lot of different hybrids and varieties of popcorn. They all look a little different, but essentially they, they look like corn. And I guess the main way you can tell the difference, if we look at the next slide here, is to pull, pull back the husk and you can see it looks like that's what popcorn looks like. The ears, I mean, uh, they, the kernels don't dent, but you've got, uh, they're just a little smaller and look a little harder. And then on, uh, I guess we'll see the next side, you can see, see, I, I guess this is a comparison of the kernels. You can see on the left, that's a kernel of white popcorn. In the middle, we've got uh, yellow popcorn. This is a larger kernel variety. That, that's kind of what I grow. And on the right, you've got field corn. But uh, it's, oh, let's see, with, with uh, popcorn, you have two of, um, different types. I mean, the white popcorn and yellow popcorn are different. They'll cross pollinate. The white, the yellow is dominant. So you'll have, it'll be just like sweet corn when you eat yellow and white mixed together. Um, if you, I mean, all the yellow popcorn crosses with white, it's still gonna be yellow, but uh, a lot of the white popcorn when it's crossed with yellow will be yellow. So that can be a problem. I know I've um, talked to the company, they used to, or they grow white popcorn and, and somebody planted a, a garden full of uh, yellow popcorn right next to it. And that kind of ruined for about, uh, oh, it'd be about a quarter mile around the field is about how far the pollen can go. So after then they told him they'd give him all the, all the uh, yellow popcorn he wanted if he just didn't grow any. So that seemed to work out for them. And on uh, the next slide, I think we've got, uh, let's see. Okay, well, that's right. Can we go back to the, to the previous slide? Um, you can see that like an ear of popcorn is on the left and on the right is uh, an ear of field corn. Um, that ear of field corn is a little bit small because, well, this year the was a dry year, so the ears didn't get quite as big. But uh, now if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about um, what makes it pop. We've got, uh, oh, you can see that this is a picture. The picture on the left looks like field corn. Um, you've got uh, the hull, uh, um, the hull is made up of um, hard starch. And, but on field corn, you have hard starch and soft starch both. The bottom part will be soft starch. And um, so it can't hold, I mean, it leaks, you could say. But on, po on the popcorn kernel, you can see on the, on the, I guess on, on the top middle picture there of the, the yellow, notice the kernel is hard all the way around. It's um, the whole kernel is pretty much encased with uh, hard or flinty, we call it hard or flinty starch. And that um, limits the escape of water from the kernel. It keeps, it holds it in. And so when you heat it up, try to heat it up rapidly, the water turns to steam and steam expands. And rather than leaking out like it would say in field corn, um, it makes the kernel explode. Just, I mean, just, just like a bomb, only that doesn't sound good, so we say pop. But um, so for, for it to pop good, it needs to, the moisture needs to be say between 12 and 15%. If there's too much, it kind of just poofs up a little bit. And if it's too dry, it won't pop at all. That's where the, the term that, uh, it's not used so much anymore, but they used to, used to call them old maids because they're just old and dried out. But uh, <clears throat> so then there, um, if we go on to the, I think the next slide, we, yeah, we here we've got, um, I mean, this is again showing how the, how the, the moisture expands and makes the kernel blow up. Now, if you want to see a, a good example, um, we couldn't get it on here, but on my, my website, is, um, I've got a website, fitpop or fit-pop.com. Um, I have a, a video of, of popcorn popping in slow motion. And it's, it's like the whole thing, I think it, they take about 15, 20 seconds to show a kernel pop. And it's it just showing it kind of turn inside out. 
ex expanding out. Now on the right, we have uh, two different kinds, two different types of uh, popcorn. Uh, the top one is called um, it, it popping. It, it's called the the resulting kernel, popped kernel has ears on it. Is what the, you have the different uh, protrusions. Those are the ears sticking out. And on the bottom kernel, that's called a mushroom popping, where it just kind of pops into one big ball. Now the difference for that, um, for use, uh, the bottom kernel works good for say like making flavored popcorn, like caramelizing. Because uh, with the ears, they would tend to break off. And the bottom, with when you don't have the ears on it, they, it all it stays solid and you get a, a bigger kernel. So it works better. But um, let's see, also we have, oh, what's next here? I think we've got, uh, we have another slide here, I think. Yeah, okay, we got kind of, the process like yellow and white. You can see when they, when they're popped, they both look about the same. We have yellow yellow popcorn on the top and white popcorn on the bottom. But um, I mean, the yellow tends to have a I guess the people that like it. I mean, the yellow pops bigger than the white does, but the white the hull tends to break up better. They call it um, popcorn. The different varieties are rated on hull dispersion. They call it. That's how well the the hull breaks up. It spreads out, so it's like it breaks up in a lot of pieces. You don't really notice it when you're eating it. And whereas, whereas the yellow, the hull is thicker, so it doesn't break up quite as much. Now, some of the corn I plant, um, it's been bred into it. So if the hull, it depends on how you pop it, the hull will um, actually pop off the kernel altogether, so you don't have any any hull on it. But let's see, there, yeah, the different types of popcorn we're going. I mean, there's yellow and white, and like like field corn, there's just Oh, I got an infinite number of different hybrids or varieties of uh, yellow. But uh, one thing I always try to tell people, it, um, I know I, I see a lot in the stores like, or, or um, different companies will say how they, there's no GMOs in our popcorn. And that's a true statement, but um, <laughs> there aren't GMOs in any popcorn because pop, GMO popcorn has not been developed yet and it, it probably never will be because there's just probably really not enough money into it but that that's that brings up another thing i want to talk about real quick with the gmo crops and a lot of crops are, are um so, sorry sorry jim oh yeah we we do have to go i wasn't able to give the two minute warning there um but but yeah it's it's past time so um you know i i think anyone do you have an email you can um, yeah, share. I, I, I thought you were going to put it up, but okay. Yeah. My, oh, oh, oh. Well, let me let me do that. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. But if anybody has any questions, they can um, contact me on Facebook. I guess I've got Fitkin Popcorn, and it'll show up on there. And then um, you can uh, or you can email me at uh, jimfitkin gmail com or or um, just popcorn uh, I, I mean go to fit pop the website and just email popcorn and, and it'll get to me so but yeah here we have okay some contact information and if you, so if you have any questions just contact me some way so okay thank you thank you so much jim carrie byram will be talking about the challenges of growing hops in iowa She must be muted. Thank you, yes. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and get going right into the next slide there. Um, I'm gonna try to get through this as much as we can. Um, in the top photo there, you can see myself, I'm Carrie Byram, that's my husband, Mike, and the bottom photo is my dad, Rusty Limaster. We started Cedar Falls Hops in April of 2017 when my husband and I made the decision to move from Florida back to the family farm that I grew up on just outside of Cedar Falls. Our first year, we started with four acres of hops adding those in the spring. And in the fall, we planted three more acres of hops for a total of seven acres at our farm. If you wanna to go to the next slide. 
So why did we decide to start putting in hops? Um, it's that innate belief in a local product for local markets. Um, state laws had changed recently, and this was 2015, 16, 17, to make craft beer more accessible and more friendly, if you will, the laws here in Iowa. So craft breweries were growing quickly and that pace really hasn't slowed down. Um, in Cedar Falls, where we're at, we have three breweries, which for a small town is, is a pretty good number. And it also, we decided to go with hops because my background is in horticulture and my dad's been a farmer his whole life. As he was kind of transitioning out of farming, um, we thought that, you know, the combining my background for horticulture and his farming background would be a really good intersection for hops. And we love beer, so that didn't hurt anything either. Next slide. So to be honest, we naively thought that all these local breweries would want to use local hops. Why wouldn't they, right? Um, most hops in the U.S. come from the Pacific Northwest. 95% of the hops come from Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And it seemed like, why would you do that if you can get a local crop? Well, it turns out that there's some hesitancy there, and I'll talk about that more as we go. Next slide. So to do some hop basics, because you may not be familiar with this plant, it is a perennial plant. Um, we hope to have these around for 20 to 25 years. So we plant them once. Each year they grow, they're um, 20 feet tall, and then they die back to the ground and emerge each spring. Technically speaking, hops are a bine with a B, not a vine. They have no tendrils, but they wrap themselves around the string as they grow to adhere. The only use for hops is beer. That's it. What we're harvesting from the plant are the cones that you see there and that yellow stuff inside is what we need. That's the lupulin that gives beer its flavor, its bitterness, its um, storage ability, so many of those things. And every plant in our field is a female. Um, pollination would simply cause the plant to set seeds and decrease that oil content, which is not something we want. Next slide. So one of the challenges for us is there are more than 160 different hop varieties. And I relate hop varieties to apples, the way you would use certain apples for different purposes. There are hops that are better for certain styles of beer than others. And it can be a challenge to decide which varieties to grow, especially when there's some varieties that are proprietary that we simply cannot get access to. Next slide. And we'll just see here for a second, this is a hop field toward the end of June. You can see the plants have grown from the ground up to that top wire at 18 feet in just a few weeks. And next slide. I try not to spend too much time on this, but people tend to be really interested. One of the hurdles for growing hops is the startup cost. It's very expensive to fill a field full of poles. And here you can see we use 22 foot long poles that are four feet deep in the ground. So that creates our 18 foot tall trellis. There's more than 10 miles of cable that, um, this was a construction photo that were run along the top of that. And we each spring, we hand tie um, a single string for each plant and we tie it on the cable and then pin it down into the ground. And that has to be done every year. Next slide. So for us, variety selection is really important. I mentioned that there's all of those different varieties and different brewers prefer different varieties. And it takes three years for our plants to reach maturity. So from the time we start having those conversations for, with a brewer, it's three years until we can really give them the quantity of hops that they need. And because hops are new, in Iowa, we're still finding out which varieties do well here and which don't. Um, two years ago, we lost an acre of hops plants with a variety called Southern Cross. Nobody had grown them here before. And we found that they broke dormancy very early. So on a warm day in late February, the plants started to grow and our subsequent cold weather caused those um, crowns to get rot in them and they all died. Not a fun lesson to learn, but it's part of the challenge. Next slide. So when we're looking at success, and what does that look like for us? Our goal is we need a thousand pounds of hops per acre. Um, if you start considering growing hops, there's different calculators online and 
I think a thousand pounds in Iowa is a good number to work from. Um, we want a consistent product and we judge that based on the laboratory results because we send in our finished hops for testing every year. The bottom photo there shows what a finished hop product looks like. The plants get um, put through a harvester, the cones removed, they get dried and sent through a pellet mill so that they are in that, I call it the rabbit food form that you see there. And then that can get stored in a freezer facility until they're sent to the brewer. Um, when we're selling hops, and this has been a challenge, but we have a key window from September until December when Iowa hops are available, but hops from the Pacific Northwest are not. And we have to really try to optimize that time frame. Next slide. So if you're considering growing hops, it's really important to ask the brewers because you're more than likely you've been visiting a, a tap room, ask them if they use local hops. There's tends to be a disconnect between brewers who say they will and if they're actually doing it. If they're not actually using Iowa hops yet, ask them why, um, because it's really important to try to get them over that hurdle before you commit to growing. Next slide. And my advice for new growers, you need to think about your processing. The processing equipment is very expensive. We don't have it on our farm. We utilize other growers who do. Um, you need to know about that. Our main labor times are April and May and August, September when we're talking about harvesting. We also have to know your customers and know what quantity they use. It's very important to talk to those folks about if they're using 10 pounds a year or if they're using 200 pounds a year. I'm gonna go next slide. Here you can see our contact information. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer. We are also happy to host people if you want to come visit the fields and learn some more. Thank you so much, Carrie. Yes. Uh, next, we have Chris McGuire, who will be talking about eradicating Canadian thistle in an apple orchard. So yeah, this is Chris McGuire from Two Onion Farm, and I'm going to talk about an on-farm research experiment we did the last two years on controlling Canada thistle organically in our apple orchard. Next slide. So just a quick bit of background about us. We have uh, two acres of organic apples in southwestern Wisconsin, pretty close to Dubuque, Iowa, and where it's certified organic and we're marketing it in our area to individuals, grocery stores and other farms. Next slide. So we're growing exclusively dwarf apple trees and um, one of their drawbacks is that they don't withstand competition from weeds at all. So for many years, we've been spreading this hardwood bark mulch that you see in the picture there in a band um, down the row of trees. And that does a great job of suppressing annual weeds and also you know, protecting the soil from erosion and, and building organic matter. Next slide. But it has the weakness that it can be invaded by sort of underground perennial spreading weeds that can just poke up through the mulch and proliferate and form a patch. And Canada thistle is the one we've had the most trouble with. You can go forward again. Because um, it has really deep roots. Once it's established in that mulch around the trees, uh, it's not impossible to you know, dig it out without uprooting the trees. So we did some reading on this. And what we learned was that you know, it is possible to eliminate this weed but you've got to repeatedly kill the thistle shoots um, again and again. Go forward again. Next slide. So I have a picture here that kind of shows this process. Um, so on the left, say you have a vibrant, healthy thistle shoot growing from a deep root with lots of energy stored there. And the middle picture shows you know, that above ground shoot has been chopped off, but the root underground is still alive. And in the third picture, it's using its energy to fuel regrowth of a new shoot. Go forward again. And then you know, that shoot will continue to grow, drawing energy from the root. 
And there comes a time when you want to go in and kill it again before it gets too big, as it is in the picture on the right. Um, because at that point, it, that shoot is healthy, it's photosynthesizing, and it's returning energy down to the root. And the root can then fuel the growth of, of new shoots, and the patch will expand. So if you get it at that three-week interval, you're you know, depleting the root and not letting it replenish its resources. Go forward again. So we read about this and it was exciting, but we wondered how we could like practically implement that on our own farm. It seems like a lot of work and to be doing that constantly through the growing season. So we got uh, this small grant for some on-farm research where we wanted to measure how expensive and time consuming it was to kill the shoots every three weeks using each of these different methods, pulling by hand, hoeing them off with a diamond hoe, cutting them down with a gas powered string trimmer like in this picture and spraying an organic army um, listed herbicide called Avenger. Um, so we tried all these in a number of different plots in our orchard and also each of these four treatments, we um, did it in areas where we only had our bark mulch and also in plots where we had a layer of recycled cardboard underneath the bark and go forward. So the graph on this slide shows basically, you know, the thistle population over time in these experimental plots. And the key take home here is that everything we did worked. All the different treatments eliminated the thistle within two growing seasons. So we started with some really dense plots and we ended up with no thistle, which was great. Um, the other big uh, lesson here is that the four lines that have squares, uh, you see that they sort of peaked early on. So the thistle population kind of expanded actually and then finally went down. The four lines with the triangles, the thistle population went down more quickly. So those triangle treatments were the ones where we had the layer of cardboard along the soil surface. So that really suppressed the thistle and made the populations decline more quickly. But any way that we could cut those shoots down every three weeks worked and eliminated the weed. Go forward again. So we measured the um, time and uh, materials needed to implement all these different treatments. And the uh, key things we saw here were that, you know, pulling the shoots out by hand was very time consuming and just not economical. Um, if we sprayed it with the organic herbicide, that was really quick and efficient, but it cost a lot of money. Um, and because that product is expensive. So that also wasn't really you know, economical for us. The treatments that were most cost effective were hoeing and um, weed whacking with the string trimmer. The cardboard mulch um, suppressed the thistle populations really quickly early on, but it actually wasn't cost effective because it took so much time to put that mulch down that it wasn't worth, um, wasn't really worth it in the end. Next slide. So, um, you know, the string trimming and hoeing sort of worked the best. Um, some other things that we noticed in the course of this was that um, those two treatments particularly kind of degraded the mulch. If we were hoeing or weed whipping all the time, we sort of stirred the mulch up and it tended to break down quicker, which is a disadvantage. Um, the string trimmer was also not very effective against other weeds. It worked well against the thistle, but really low growing weeds like dandelion and crabgrass. Um, we had trouble getting the head of the string trimmer like down close to the ground and, and chewing those other weeds up. Whereas hoeing or the other treatments were able to you know, kill any weed, not just Canadian thistle. Um, and on a sort of personal quality of life level, we weren't really big fans of using the string trimmer every three weeks, you know, it's just noisy and vibrates you and it has annoying maintenance issues all the time that crop up. So our first choice, you know, for going forward in our orchard is just to go through and if there's a thistle patch getting going to cut it out with a hoe every three weeks. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out with this picture here is that you know, we did this experiment in that mulched area under the tree rows. Um, we also have all this grass sod in between the rows and at the ends of the rows. Um, we mow that pretty uh, meticulously, you know, about once a week during the growing season. And not just for aesthetics, but because it, that really does a, a big job in suppressing thistle and keeping it out of the grass so then it won't constantly be colonizing the mulch where it can really become a problem. So um, next slide, 
that's all I really had to say. If you go to our website, twoonionfarm.com, there is like a full report of this project if you want to really delve into it. Um, you can also reach out. My email address is here. I'd be glad to answer questions. So thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Chris. Now we're gonna to move to Nelson Smith, who's gonna talk about springtime cultivator in row crops. There we go. <clears throat> it's it's springtime actually is what it is, but that that's good. Um, <clears throat> we have a um, row crop farm here in Southeast Iowa. We have about 300 acres of row crops and we have uh, about 150 acres of alfalfa. And we rotate between corn, um, soybeans, oats, alfalfa, rye, buckwheat. We have several smaller uh, crops that come in that we put in depending on the year and how the other crops work out. <clears throat> if you go, go to the next slide, please. The Treffler tine weeder is a <clears throat> machine that's made in Germany. And <clears throat> it started out that we, uh, I had never used a tine weeder before. We used the rotary hoe, we used a cultivator, and that was our main cultivation. The tine weeder came from Germany, this particular one, and I kind of fell into it accidentally. The neighbor had signed up to uh, do a demonstration of it through PFI. And they brought them into uh, the Illinois area. They had three tine weeders and they took one and went across uh, Illinois and Iowa and came down around through Missouri and back up, headed back to the Chicago area. And the neighbor said that they couldn't do the demonstration, wanted to know if I would do the demonstration. So <clears throat> I said, well, well, we'll try it. And they came and we put it on the tractor and our beans were a little shorter than these beans right here at this time. This is right after the, the uh, field day. But <clears throat> after I saw how well that the time weeder did, uh, I actually decided that it needed to stay on my tractor. So we they had they were not stopping at any more places in their uh, travels. So we made a deal and I ended up with a tine weeder that I had only seen for one day and never used more than that time. What you see right here is actually the soybeans. I went on a 45 degree angle across the field because the tine weeder can go actually between the soybeans and work those uh, weeds out of the center of the row, which a cultivator cannot. There's no area for a row to go through. It's a solid tine weeder. If you can go to the next slide, please. It's a solid setup of tines on a 30 foot tine weeder, which is what ours is, which is 12 30 inch rows. You have 327 tines. Well, if you take those tines and put them all right close to each other and line them up, there's less than an inch between there that is not actually worked by the tine weeder. So when you're running down the field, you can see there's no place for a crop row, whether it's corn or soybeans or anything else to go through there. But the row will get cleaned out because the tines will go in there and they are each spring loaded. So you can <clears throat> adjust the tension on the tines as you go through the field when the conditions change. You can see on the bottom of those uh, tines that there's a little uh, gray spot there. That's a carbide tip. They're carbide tip. You can get them either way, carbides or non-carbide, non but the carbide tip will last a lot longer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the <clears throat> weeder here is going through soybeans. And this is, they're about uh, six to nine inches tall right here. And you'll see that those soybeans have to work their way through those tines because the tines are a solid group. They have the six rows of tines and then it's 30 foot 
width on it for the 12 rows. You'll see it's a double fold um, weeder. So it folds up so it's only 10 feet wide when you're going down the road because it, the each outside will fold in and then that, that whole section folds up again. You can go through these soybeans that we're going through right here at anywhere from six to seven miles per hour. It shakes the soybeans a lot and, and it really makes them jump around, but you'll lose a few leaves, but the soybeans will put on leaves right after that and it's not a problem. You can see how well it does the ahead of the tine weeder. That was uh, probably two weeks ago that it had been cultivated. So what I do is I take the cultivator through, then I'll take the tine weeder through, and then I'll alternate back and forth, which the cultivator will kind of hill up the, the ground over your along your row, and the tine weeder will shake that loose and smooth it out so it's level again. Next slide, please. This is from the front. You see the <clears throat> wheels in the front of the tine weeder. There are also two wheels in the back. The tine weeder can stay. Yeah, hold this one right here, please. This is <clears throat> at the planting time. This is right after we planted. I'll run the tine weeder over the ground just before we plant to get a nice firm and uh, even uh, seed bed. As you can see on the right side, that's what it looks like after it's been through. The 12 row planter went through with all its rows and press wheels. And those press wheels and the tires and the tractor tires all press that ground back down, which also plants all the seeds for the weeds. So the, <clears throat> the weeds are asked to come back up right away. So that's why I hit it the day after the planting and loosen that ground up that's been packed in there where those seeds, weed seeds are starting to sprout and it'll bring them right up and uh, <clears throat> loosen that up so you've gotten your first, the easiest time to get a weed is when it first wants to sprout. And that's the time you can get it and take care of it because once they get established, they're much harder to get. That's why I'll alternate with the regular cultivator going through and it'll take out those established weeds, loosen them up and then the tiny weeder will come through and shake it out and bring it to the top again. Next slide. This is actually a video. I don't know if, can, if you can start that. Will that run, Mike? If it doesn't run, that's fine too. But you can see right down at the lower right hand side there, there's a, a number line up and it's zero to nine. That shows you the tension that you have on that. And on the left side, you'll see a yellow pipe with the, that's where all the cables uh, bolt on and as you turn that pipe hydraulically it pulls that cable which tightens the springs on each one of those tines so you can adjust that on your way through if you look there's a silver piece it's kind of out of focus because this is a, just a still shot of a, a movie but it's right at six so i'm running it at six on that uh, <clears throat> tension or there and uh, I, I can run it heavier or I can run it lighter depending on the height and the, the uh, difficulty of the plant to, to keep its roots. So when you're running early in the season, you'll run it a lot lighter on the tension because you don't wanna tear out those uh, young plants. And then as the season goes by, which I can actually go through soybeans when they're t uh, 12 inches tall, a foot tall, and you can run your uh, tension much higher then because it, it, the plant is established in there. Should I run the video, Nelson? Sure, if you can. Let me try. If it'll run. It's trying to move a little bit. The other thing is with the wheels in the back of this uh, tying weeder, that the top link on the three point hitch is in a slot. It's not a so solid hole. So the, the tractor can move up and down and go back and forth and the, the tying weeder will stay 
parallel to the ground, which means that the front tines are digging in just as much as the back tines, and you don't have that problem if you had a solid connection on that top link. You could actually have the back tines not touching nor the front tines not touching depending on on how it works. The <clears throat> Treffler tine weeder is made in Germany. This tine weeder that you see right there is the third one in the United States. And this was in 2016. It's also the first one that was in the state of Iowa. And we are now a promoter for that. Uh, Treffler has a, a booth at PFI. So if you're looking for more information on it, we also have more videos from there. Is there another slide? I don't believe so. I think this is okay. This is the end. Uh, Nelson, do you have uh, an email, folks? I, I didn't put an email on, on this presentation. Do you have an email folks can reach you at? Yeah, you can get it on our uh, booth from the Treffler um, Man at Machine, but uh, it's sawport at gmail.com, S-A-W-P-O-R-T at gmail.com. And that'll Wonderful. get to me too, but you, you can go to that, to our booth site and uh, look at it there too. You see that the, <clears throat> the time, is that- We gotta, we gotta time? go to the next um, person. Okay. Now, thank you so much for that presentation. And thank you. now we have the last, uh, but not least is uh, Mary Swander, who will be talking about farm jokes. And I will stop the share. Hey. And. Ready? Why did the farmer's chicken cross the road, then jump into the mud puddle and cross back again? Because he was a dirty double crosser. What in farm country goes clippity clop, bang, bang, clippity clop, bang, bang? That's an Amish drive-by shooting. I'm Mary Swander, and I'm the executive director of Ag Arts, which is a nonprofit designed to imagine and promote healthy food systems through the arts. And this is my favorite joke that I heard from my Amish neighbors, mind you, at our neighborhood picnic. So there was one Amish man and two English, which call anybody that's not Amish, in a sauna. And they were sweating away there. And there was like this dit, 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 buzzer. And one of the English guys pressed his elbow like this and said, yeah, yeah, I'll be there in about an hour. And the Amish guy said, what, what was that? And he said, oh, that was just my office calling they want me back there soon and so they're sweating away and then they heard this ring 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 and the other english guy put his hand up to his ear uh-huh yeah okay honey yeah okay yeah and amish said guy said what was that oh that was just my wife i have a built-in phone in my hand here and he goes what was that thing on the guy's elbow and he said oh he's got a built-in buzzer there the Amish guy said, okay, I'll be back in a minute. He went off to go to the restroom. He came back with some toilet paper trailing out of his behind down his leg. And the two English guys said, now what is that? And the Amish guy said, that's a fax coming in. <laughs> So the Methodist church near me had a uh, bluegrass festival a couple summers ago. And at the beginning of the bluegrass festival, the toilets were plugged, but the festival continued anyway in the grove behind the Sunday school meeting rooms. 
The church grandmothers crossed their legs and squeezed. Leaning back in their lawn chairs, the action on the stage too good to be missed. The church perched atop a hill surrounded by cornfields, its attendees drawn from the sparse numbers of non-Amish or English in the rural community. A family band had taken over the platform, mother on bass, tall son on guitar, short son on banjo, and a daughter on fiddle. A father stood to the side, neither singing nor playing an instrument. The two boys just a year apart, 15 and 14, the older at least two feet taller than the younger, were matching solid green shirts and khaki pants. Their heads shaved with identical buzz cuts. The mother and daughter wore matching solid blue blouses and flowery print skirts. The father matched no one. The silver maple tree arched over their heads, casting shade on the performers. The Norway spruce trees swayed behind them in the breeze. The branches parting just enough to frame the rows of knee-high corn running up the hill, then down toward the unincorporated, not on the map village of Sharon Center, population 63. Just three miles up the road from where I live, Sharon Center is the closest town to my house. Welcome to the Bluegrass Festival, the father said. You can see the skyline of Sharon Center behind you. The silhouettes of the village's 12 houses, one grain elevator, and one welding shop clumped together on the horizon. Oli went to the Sons of Norway Hall one night and finally won the door prize, which was a toilet brush. The banjo playing brother craned his neck into the mic. Oli was so excited that he won, he brought the brush home and used it often. Someone asked him during the next meeting what the prize was and if he liked it or not. Oli replied, yeah, I like the toilet brush, but I think I'm going to go back to using paper. The church grandmothers squeezed harder, their legs kicking back and forth. The daughter, just 13 years old, stood confidently by the microphone, her voice authentic old time style, nasal loud sliding from one note to another up and down the scale. Although slightly off key, but with enough gusto to command the gathering. Children balancing and swinging on the playground jungle gym, men twirling hot dogs on the grill, mothers spraying bug repellent on their ankles. Her mouth drawn open in a straight wide line, the daughter's solo blasted out from the speakers, filling the grove. This family is Catholic, my neighbor Donna whispered in my ear. It's an ecumenical concert. She rested her cup of ice water in the holder of the arm of the chair and munched on some popcorn. Now the banjo player brother took the mic again. Lena was being interviewed for a job as a housekeeper for the very wealthy Mrs. Diamond who asked her, do you have any religious views? No, Lena said but I have some very nice pictures of Norway. Then the guitar player brother, his legs open in a wide stance at the mic, hunched over his Martin and threw back his imaginary head of hair. His voice deep, low and booming echoed through the grove. One day Ole had a hand grenade in the house and he'd kept it since the war. He showed it to Sven, the banjo playing brother said. Sven picked it up and asked, how does it work? How does it work? And he pulled the pin. Throw it, Oli said, throw it out the window. So Sven threw it out the window and it hit the outhouse and exploded. Just then they saw Oli's grandma run away from the outhouse. That must've been a big one, he said. The church grandmothers rolled their eyes and fanned themselves with their hats. Just then, a truck carrying two porta potties pulled into the drive. Relieved, everyone sang.
So I am looking for jokes and I am offering a hundred dollars for the best joke that I have a podcast called Ag Arts from Horse and Buggy Land. Write it on an email, send me an audio file. I'm swandermary at gmail.com. Get onto Ag Arts website. We have Facebook page, Instagram. Any way you can want to communicate is great with me, but send me a joke and I'm going to gather them all together and have a podcast of PFI farmer jokes. Got to be about a farmer, got to be, be a joke. So that's all the requirement can be long, short. They've been coming in. I got a bunch of jokes coming in last night. So add to that and tune in to Ag Arts from Horse and Buggy Land, my podcast. It's really growing in popularity. Thank you so much, Mary. That was awesome. Uh, so we've come to the end of the hour. Thanks everyone for joining us. And to Dana, Jim, Carrie, sorry, Carrie, Chris, Nelson, and Mary for their wonderful presentations.